via telephone as we are in studio with uh, co-host Matt Miller and uh, John Gilstrap. Eric Tarr, he is the Senate Finance Chairman. Eric, thanks so much for joining us. Good morning to you, sir. Oh, thanks for having me on. Are you home now or are you still in Charleston? No, I'm actually sitting in the Finance Committee room right now because we have there's some construction going on outside and my office was a little too loud, so... Yeah, what what uh, what all's happening in the chambers there? I understand some major renovations are taking place. Yeah, they're the actual the east wing and the uh, the chamber for the house is under construction, and then there's also they've been for quite a while now. The courtyard area on the north side of the Capitol has been under construction, uh, replacing a lot of stonework on that side, and then there are also um, the walkways that go from the chambers across the roof into the offices. Uh, of the Senate and of the House is also uh, getting some roof work placed over it as well. It's, uh, um, it's a safety concern on that one for sure because we, you know, when you go across in the winter, we're walking across the ice in, in dress shoes going back and forth. And so it's, uh, we're putting some cover over that to have a dry walkway. Well, that's good. Good stuff. We don't need any of you guys falling down, breaking an arm. No, no, not at all. I'm a physical therapist and it's job security. But I, don't think I, get <laughs> I say you're out there sweeping up the salt. Make sure you, don't, don't, don't melt, don't melt. <laughs> Eric Tarr is our guest here on the program. So and let's talk first and foremost uh, about the jails situation because, one, there's a uh, lawsuit now pending. Uh, Stephen New apparently has brought a lawsuit naming the governor, and the legislature, too, is involved in this uh, lawsuit. What seems to be the major issues of this suit, Eric? I know you're probably not allowed to comment on a whole lot of this, but maybe you could just kind of give us the facts of the case, so to speak. Well, I think as, you know, as far as the facts of the case itself, um, I'm not sure on all the stuff you had, but some of the stuff I saw seemed to be a bit absurd um, on having the courts require the legislature to appropriate more money into um, deferred maintenance and we've already done that uh, substantially by the way so because in this past special session we passed legislation that uh, for higher education and for corrections i think it was about 238 million dollars for deferred maintenance that could go over there and then in this extraordinary special session we also put another 15 million in deferred maintenance that was to go into corrections so um that's kind of already going on so to me i don't know if that's an optics thing for their lawsuit as, as so much as actually practical. Um, and then on the remainder of it, there's there's been some real problems within the correction system, and, and uh, I don't think anybody will deny that, where we, as before COVID, if you guys will recall, back before COVID hit, we had a labor shortage within the correction system. And so the legislature went back and raised those incomes by about $10,000 for those correctional officers and they, they filled up those positions substantially with that. And then COVID hit, and as it happened, and we lost labor force, and then we ended back up into the same situation. Well, what we didn't do, and we, we learned lessons from then, is we just did raises. Uh, so we went in and did the raises and uh, saw some improvement uh, in staffing. And But the thing that attracts and keeps and retains those officers still needed attention. So um, the Senate president and, and – and in his wisdom, has since um, for months now has been having recurring meetings every two weeks. He's been having stakeholders come in from the governor's staff, from the administration of Department of Corrections, uh, House leadership, and then Senate leadership. And we've been doing these meetings every couple of weeks to come in and try to figure out, aside from money, what affects the quality of the career experience for a correctional officer and what affects the safety for an inmate and the safety for an officer. And that resulted in a lot of bills uh, going out this special session around corrections, aside from just the, just the pay on it. And aside from the legislation, it also um, really it permitted corrections to, to go in and do things that they thought they would need, otherwise legislative permission they really didn't need to, to go in and make substantive changes within the correction system for retaining the people that they hire. So um, we, we had some pretty powerful legislation that end. Uh, a lot of um, strong work went into it. I mean, the strong, it was, it was passionate. People were had, had the goal in mind. It was a common effort to get to an improvement in this system. So I think what we're going to see is a significant improvement over the period of, of months. It's not going to happen instantly. And the reason it doesn't happen instantly is deploying um, more than $100 million into deferred maintenance takes time. Uh, for that to actually to come to fruition to where it actually is a an end product. 
It also takes time to hire all the people that you would go in and replace the National Guard's in there with and, and then beyond because there's still vacancies that even the National Guard's not filling within the correction system. So um, there's a lot to be done, but um, I, I have a lot of confidence now that they have the resources to get it done. When you hire, and I know you're not directly involved in this in a detailed sense, but when they hire a corrections officer, is there like a corrections officer boot camp that you go to like we do with st state troopers and police where they have an academy, or is this on-the-job training to get you up to speed? Well, prior to these meetings, it was kind of like we talked about a boot camp, about six weeks. They would have to go down to the academy. Um, so for any positions, you're going to be hired within the correction system. You're going to have to go away from your family, go to the academy uh, for six weeks, and then come back. And what would happen, what we, what we found is they were hiring about 600 people a year and only retaining about 300. And a lot of those individuals would get lost in the fact that they couldn't stay away from their family that long for that training. And it wasn't necessary for the training to be held at the academy. So one of the things that they did internally throughout these discussions is they started the training at the correctional facility. So if you're somebody who thinks you want to be a corrections officer, and you go in to work, instead of the first day on the job being at the academy, your first day on the job now is actually at the correctional facility shadowing with an experienced correctional officer so or somebody in correction staff, so you're seeing what you're getting into. You do that for a couple of weeks. That's part of your training. And then after you're there a couple of weeks, now you're going to go over to the academy for the other four weeks. So the, there's a couple of things that that really benefits. One is um, people get to go into the training eyes wide open at that point. And then the second thing is is that the expense that you have in training somebody, so they're, they're dropping about $14,000 in expenses in training for that six weeks of training and then losing half of the people they're putting through the training. So over you know the course of a year, you're looking, we're, we're estimating the savings on that as we go through probably in the neighborhood of 4 to $5 million just in training expense. And then you have a higher retention of the people you're hiring. So um, – that's uh, that's just one of the changes they've been making internally, and I, and I had them give me a list, and I don't have a list right in front of me. I, I apologize. I was I was shuffling through my papers. I've stuck it somewhere on my desk, and I don't have it. But they gave me about two pages worth of things they've already began to implement just from these discussions to change that quality of of career experience for the correctional officers. Delegate John Hardy, who's the vice chair of finance on the House side, just sent me a graphic that I have on my phone about the pay raises. If you if you were a correctional officer one, and you previously started at thirty three two, you would now start at forty thousand five hundred, and then that's what's what's proposed. And then there's another category that says CVPS, and that's about five thousand dollars higher. I don't know what that is. Do you know what that is, Eric? Yeah, that's your critical vacancy pay supplemental. Okay. So if you're in an area that has, um, if you go across state state government, um, and it, the way we'll budget for payroll is that we'll put a line into something called personal services, and that line is budgeted relative to the amount of FTEs we think it takes to, when I say we, the legislature thinks it takes to operate that corrections, or well, for this instance, corrections, but that executive agency or department. And so for um, corrections, they have in some, in some places up as much as a 70% vacancy. And this is where you're seeing the state of emergency with the National Guard going in to, to fill positions that they have not been able to hire for or retain people for. And then in other places, they may have vacancies that are 13, 14 percent. So, but across state agencies, if you look at it, the vacancy average is about 13 to 14 percent. And what they'll do with the money that's appropriated into those lines um, where those vacancies aren't filled, they'll turn around and use those for operational costs. And that's kind of how they, they manage their cash flow side of things. And so, in these critical vacancy areas, what happens is when you got these huge vacancies, they're having to go in and pay a lot of overtime. They're having to go in and pay increased money in order to have the National Guard in there because they got to pay the National Guard to have those officers in there. So what we've done, done in those areas, wherever you have those levels of critical vacancy across the state, that there is that, that supplemental pay that comes in there of an extra 5000 to the base salary of what we added to the beginning base pay for those positions. Okay, Matt Miller. Eric, you mentioned earlier uh, deferred maintenance. Can you explain, is, is that needs in facilities around the state that have kind of been pushed off and now certain improvements need to be made? 
Yeah, when um, um, for years and years, the, as we were in situations to where you're just trying to figure out how to make it, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty much in our short-term memory right now for anybody in the legislature that when we came in 2015-16, we're looking at $250 million or $450 million deficits on a $4.5 billion budget. So but getting to that point builds up an awful lot of maintenance issues that the state just did not afford. So think about you know something in, in your own business or home uh, that's needing fixed, and you're worrying about how to make sure you, you've got the mortgage paid next week and you've got the electric bill paid. But you you got this spot on the roof, you know you're going to have to fix it at some point. So that's kind of where the state had been for years. And now as we're getting through and looking at uh, budget surplus, at the time of our um, uh, history here, there's a lot of things we did. One is we started right-sizing our budget that's our operational budget so that we could go in, create efficiencies within the executive agencies, um, and within the legislative process, because you know, you notice well, now we get sessions done in 60 days instead of 90 or 120 days. And so we've 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 also held ourselves to that standard of increasing the efficiencies. And that goes back again to the Senate President and his leadership to go back and say we're going to get this done in 60 days in a budgeting process when he was finance chair. And so we've we've held that through. And as we go. Um, through that process of efficiency, that also brings up more revenue to be able to apply to things that are not your recurring expenses, so deferred maintenance. Those are those one-time expenditures. As those deferred maintenance issues accumulate, they become more expensive. They become more expensive because of inflation if you hold them off. They come, become more expensive because the operations within an agency – that have to now work in an environment where the tools and resources available to them don't function properly. So now you've got more time involved in, in the operations of that agency. And then you also have the kind of the, the cascade that happens from certain deferred maintenance issues, that if it's a roof issue and water comes through and it gets on your floor, now it's not just a roof issue. You also got to replace the floor. So those type of things have been accumulating over the decades. And what we're doing now is going back and trying to get an inventory of what those deferred maintenance issues are, applying the funds, getting it fixed, and then going back and say, okay, let's reprioritize again. We got the, we got the fires put out. Now let's go see where the sparks are. You know, so that's kind of where our mindset is around the legislature on hitting these deferred maintenance issues so that we save taxpayer dollars going forward for this time of abundance that we're enjoying. Eric, this is John Gilstrap. <clears throat> it seems to me from what you're talking about is a lot of – the elements of this lawsuit that were just filed, perhaps the victim of, of poor timing, but the, it sounds like you're already on top of the things or, or planning to get on top of the things that you're be the state's being sued for regarding the prisons. Is that right? Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. This we're we're very very focused on, and you know I think the governor's even focused on this now. Finally, um, that um, when he you know when Secretary Sandy retired and, and you have Secretary Sorsea coming in, you, you have somebody who's coming in kind of from the outside of it all coming in with fresh eyes, and then you have a relatively uh, fresh deputy secretary with Rob Cunningham of uh, Department of Homeland Security as well, um, who's come in from, um, frankly, from outside of it as well just a short time ago, that the, that team is laser-focused on getting this uh, this fixed. And I'll tell you, um, um, Deputy Secretary Cunningham calls me frequently saying, okay, here's a problem that's going to need fixed, and this is what's going to happen if we don't fix it, and let's get a team around it. So those guys come prepared um, when they're bringing stuff to us now because they know what we're looking for at the legislative level, at legislative leadership level, to go in and get it fixed. Um, so, and it's just this isn't the only spot, guys. You know, it's just uh, across state government. Like I said, that you know, this is decades of accumulation of problems that uh, have been put off, and we're we're working to get it fixed, and we're working as fast as government could possibly work. And I'm saying that at a relative level of the country, not just relative to West Virginia. Has the state faced similar types of lawsuits from a prisoner in the past? Is there any kind of precedence or thought with how this one may turn out? Well, on, when it comes to the lawsuits associated with um, corrections itself, you're, you're speaking out of my personal expertise in this, in this whole scenario. Um, but what I can tell you is that trial lawyers have a habit of suing the state constantly as it goes, and that's just almost a um, their MO, it seems like, because they're they're pretty they're looking for a quick check. Doesn't matter if they can win a suit, 
just if they sue the state, chances are they're going to get a settlement. And that's been a problem as well. And that's a, that's a whole other problem that we got to fix because um, the state is pretty much uh, seems to be an open checkbook for trial lawyers. There was a blizzard of legislation in this uh, special session. Did anything get lost between the chambers? Anything major passed by the Senate and not passed by the House or vice versa? Yeah, I'll tell you the biggest thing. Um, there, there's several things. and I'll, I'll the, There was a rainy day smoothing formula that, that, that determines how we appropriate money into the rainy day fund that um, didn't get through the chambers. There, there was a, a rainy day transfer of $12.5 million-ish that was added on top of that that uh, didn't get through because that formula didn't get through. Uh, there was a uh, it, Department of Education of a $1.8 million that would have went to a program called Game Changers and Minecraft, uh, which is an educational program. There was a DEP mine reclamation appropriation of about $8.2 million that didn't go through. Um, there was some state parks uh, maintenance things and programs maintenance things that uh, didn't get through. There was about $2 million. And the Attorney General had requested about $2 million for the able to, to bring in outside counsel on some technology issues that didn't get through the process as well. We ran those things through on the Senate. They didn't get through on the House side. Um, but um, so, the, and I would say of those, the most critical would have been the ring day smoothing formula piece and that uh, didn't get through at all. Do those all become matters that will be addressed when you convene for the legislative session next year? I think we're going to have to because the way that we fund rainy day is that when you have a surplus, the very first appropriation that has to come out at the end of the fiscal year goes into rainy day. And we have one of the best funded rainy day, um, which is your savings account. So it's your revenue shortfall fund. We have one of the best in the country. We have almost 80 days of operating capital in our savings account, which places us about eighth in the country on how well that's funded. Um, and it's well-funded well beyond what we need for to maintain state's credit rating. So what happens is, is when you have these, these deferred maintenance issues that come before us and other issues that, that are one-time spending, either one-time spending to save money going down the road or one-time spending that will produce increased revenue that will not necessi necessitate increased taxes because it's, you know, it's an investment-type strategy. Uh, whether it's infrastructure, whether it's job creation, those type of things where we can go in and use those one-time dollars for that. Um, the, when you're in times of abundance, what happens is is the current setting that we have, it dumps a lot more money than you really need in that rainy day fund. And it pulls away from your ability to do those one-time expenditures that um, save the money, state money, save the taxpayers' money going down the road, either by reducing their expenditures or increasing revenue without touching them with more taxes. So every time the state's going to see a situation of abundance like this, what's going to happen is you're going to you're going to you're going to favor the miser kind of um, the or not theology, but I, it seems like sometimes it is a theology up here around the capital, um, as opposed to an investment strategy. Do do we do we invest and grow? And so that's kind of the discussion right now on what does that formula look like. Um, we've had a lot of good advice from our consultants that also consult with credit agencies to see where we need to go. The, the current formula we have, we have set up is, um, in my opinion, and I think in the opinion of many others, especially on the Senate side, extremely detrimental to be able to serve the people of West Virginia. I think we need to get it fixed. Eric Tarr, our guest, he is the Senate Finance Chairman. I'm going to read a comment to you from our Facebook page, a fellow by the name of Jeff Haddox who's not a bomb thrower, he, I think he tends to post fairly balanced comments. But this is his perception of the special session. It seems to me the legislature threw the Constitution out the window and went on a spending spree. What is your response to that, Eric? No, no. It's a, and there's, you know, this is extraordinary. It's, it's called an extraordinary, the first extraordinary session of 2023. And extraordinary, the word extraordinary does, applies no better than here. Um, normally what will happen with special sessions, so we go through a budgeting year, um, you finish your special session, you pass your base budget, and there's a lot of people who really don't get this, and, and, and it's difficult to get if you don't sit in the finance chair, and we're not going to get through all through that in this radio session, I'm sure, and explaining how that works. But what happens is is that there's then a 13 month, so you have all these bills that are coming in off the 13th month, and you have, um, you have also payments you have to make that really apply 
to the fiscal year that ended the month prior. So you're reconciling all that. And that results in a change in the expenditures that you actually um, budgeted for the previous year. It also, uh, if you look at what we did in 2023 session for the 24 fiscal year, we spent $10 million at that time less than the revenue estimate. And then by going into this special session, we were able to reduce the spending in that fiscal year for 2024 by a total of about $46 million. So the overall base build further reduced in this session as compared to what we actually passed out of the 23 ses regular session for fiscal year 24. And so when you go through, part of the way you do that is you're going, okay, one, you got the reconciliation. The other thing is you have, we had about $865 million in unexpended surplus. So what do you do with it? If you're a taxpayer, one of the things we have done is you, as you should be pleased is that we're returning a lot of it. You know, so we went in and did about an $800 million tax cut. 21 and a quarter percent of that was an income tax reduction with triggers for 10% each year, probably for the next eight years, the way things are going. So um, I'm extremely confident you'll see another 10% income tax reduction in this coming year because of those triggers. In spite of that, we've only had a 12% reduction in income tax. So in other words, we still have, see an economy growing such that there's still money coming more than that tax cut into the, the coffers of the state. So this gets back to that miser versus the, the capitalist or entrepreneurial um, ideology that you get into is what do you do? Well, the state's sitting on really about $2.6 billion in cash. We spent in this special session um, about, I think it was, including the transfer into the rainy day fund, was about $700 $29 million or something, somewhere in that ballpark. I'm losing the exact figure here as we're talking. Um, but it's um, – we did not throw the Constitution out the window. We did right by the taxpayers with this big time, and it took a lot of preparation. We've had meetings for months between the governor's staff, between uh, the, the Senate uh, president, myself, the House speaker. And his councils, and I think he invited other leadership. Sometimes they showed, sometimes they didn't. Um, and then uh, going through, and we've had we've had our interim sessions where we have interim committees to go in and discuss a lot of these topics. And the ones that hadn't been discussed in interim sessions, we've been discussing for years, years and years and years up here in committee, going through these processes about a problem that needs to be fixed. Well, now we have the capital to fix it. So why wait? Because we know it only gets more expensive if we wait. So I, I would I would argue the point. I know it's difficult to see sometimes from when you're looking at it through the media's eyes, and when you're looking at it from a video, or even if you're sitting up in this chamber to know what happened and how that revenue works. It's a complicated process. It's difficult to communicate communicate to 134 members, let alone the general public. We have about a minute left. In the next half hour, by the way, delegates John Hardy and Mike Hornby will join us. We're going to get into the fire. Uh, fired or fees and such. Uh, I want to ask you about the July revenue numbers, Eric, before we uh, sign off. I understand the surplus was uh, greatly reduced in the July report. Um, well, the, the surplus that came down, we um, it reduced in those numbers because of a timing issue. Um, in that month, what happens is, is that with our severance tax, it goes out across the state. Um, before the state takes their cut on that, it goes out to municipal uh, counties and municipalities, wherever it goes. And so that deposit's not going to hit until this next month that you see come in. So uh, it's, you're going to see a bump in the next one because of that decrease in the previous one. Very good. Eric, thanks so much for your time this morning. I always appreciate it, and you always do a great job explaining these things. Uh, thanks for having me on. You guys have a great day.